All right, in this video, we're going to talk about collisions between molecules. Uh, so we'll be taking some of the equations we've been looking at. Uh, we'll put together uh, a way of figuring out how many collisions a particular molecule should undergo uh, in a given time uh, in a gas at a particular pressure, say. Before we do that, uh, I have a question uh, looking back to last time for you to think about for a second, right? Uh, so I want you to think about the nitrogen and oxygen molecules in the air around you right now. Right. Uh, there are one, two, three, four, five statements down there, uh, and your question is uh, which of the following, which of those statements is true? Right. Uh, so take a moment, uh, and, and you can pause the video if you'd like, uh, and think about that. Uh, I'm going to just sort of uh, jump ahead again and just uh, remind us of what uh, depends on what. So the average kinetic energy of molecules depends only on the temperature. Right. Uh, and so therefore, the nitrogen and oxygen molecules in the room you're in uh, are at the same temperature since they're interacting with one another and, and, uh, and with the, everything else in the room. So their kinetic energies, their average kinetic energies have to be the same. Right. Uh, and so that uh, crosses off uh, a few of those things, I think. Uh, the speeds, on the other hand, will not quite be the same, right? Because nitrogen and oxygen have at least slightly different masses. Uh, molar mass is uh, 28 for the nitrogen uh, and 32 for the oxygen. Uh, so that says uh, in order to have the same kinetic energy, uh, the nitrogen molecules have to be going slightly faster than the oxygen molecules, right? If you remember back to last time, the equation for those, uh, the average speed, say, uh, depends on the square root of T over M. Uh, so that says we want the kinetic energies to be the same, uh, and we want the uh, average speed for the nitrogen to be a little bit higher. Uh, and so uh, kinetic energies are equal, the average speed of the nitrogen is slightly higher. That means I'm going for, uh, ah, hang on a second. Uh, that means I'm going for E down here on the bottom. Uh, of the slide for that one. All right, uh, now on to molecular collisions. Uh, so I want to start to think about collisions between molecules, all right? Uh, as we did uh, when we started talking about uh, the driving the gas law and whatnot, we're again going to treat our molecules like hard spheres. Uh, this is not in general a uh, perfect uh, description, uh, but it's the simplest available description, and it turns out it works decently for us, okay? Uh, so I want to imagine I have uh, collisions between a pair of hard sphere molecules. Uh, sort of by definition, that collision will take place any time uh, that the uh, centers of the two molecules, so here's my two molecules, uh, if the centers get within a distance d, where d is the diameter of one molecule, uh, then they're going to bump into each other, right? In this case, uh, we'd have a grazing collision where one of them just barely nicks the other as it passes by. Uh, if they were coming just head on, we'd have a more uh, forceful collision, say. Uh, but right now, we're just trying to count the total number of collisions, all right? Uh, so what we're going to do in order to uh, derive uh, how this should work out is we're going to do a somewhat peculiar thought experiment, okay? Uh, so I'm going to take a gas, uh, and imagine I have a gas of molecules. Uh, for now, I'll let them all be the same molecule. Uh, so I just have a, a, a homogeneous gas, uh, just one substance present. I'm going to let one molecule move, uh, and I'm going to temporarily pretend that I can lock all the other molecules in place. Just tell them to sit still. Uh, and see what happens, okay? That's obviously not realistic, but it's a good way to get started in this, uh, this thinking. So here, this one, uh, this is gonna be my moving molecule, okay? Uh, and if I have uh, this uh, V bar is the, uh, the average speed uh, of the molecules uh, with their given mass and temperature. Uh, so if I let the molecule move for one second, uh, the distance it should travel is just a distance that's equal to the magnitude of that V bar, right? So if I put that in meters per second and multiply by one second, uh, I get how many meters my molecule would travel uh, in that one second interval, okay? Uh, it's gonna hit any molecule whose center is inside of this tube, uh, where this tube is set up so that it's got a radius equal to d, the diameter of the molecule, okay? So this molecule just starts moving right down the center line of this tube, okay? Uh, and depending on the, well, the density, but therefore the pressure and temperature, what have you, of the gas, uh, the molecules whose centers are inside that tube, uh, here and here and so on, those are going to be as it says, be struck by our molecule. Uh, the other molecules that are shown here, like this one down here, its center is a little bit outside of the tube, uh, so that one is a miss. It's not going to actually bump into the, the moving molecule uh, as it goes through there, okay? Uh, 
Uh, this version in the cartoon uh, is actually kind of pretending that the molecule, not only uh, all the other molecules stand still, but that when our molecule strikes them, it doesn't actually like bounce off of them and go in a different path. We could correct for that, but it turns out it actually doesn't really matter uh, for the way that things are going to, to turn out, okay? Uh, we define often uh, this so-called collision cross-section, uh, which is uh, referred to as a sigma here. Uh, that's equal to pi times the square of the diameter of the molecule. What that is, is it's the area of this circle here, uh, which is the, the sort of the uh, head-on view of the tube. Uh, so any molecules whose centers are in there are going to be struck by the molecule as it makes its way through. Okay, so all we need to do uh, in order to get a collision number then is to figure out how many molecules actually do have their centers inside uh, of this tube, where it's got an area on the front end of pi d squared, or the sigma quantity, and it's got a length uh, of just uh, the average speed uh, times the time. Okay, so that's the way uh, we're going to think about putting this thing together. So. If we do this, uh, all we have to do is make that into an equation, okay? That was the argument. Uh, we're gonna figure out uh, this Z is our collision number, okay? Uh, this one has a prime on it because it's still under the somewhat peculiar uh, conditions that the other molecules are not moving, okay? And we're gonna have to actually make a small correction for that uh, in a moment, uh, but the correction is fairly trivial, right? So this thing where it just says Z prime of A, that says it's the collisions to be made for one molecule. Okay, this says how many times will a given molecule bump into another molecule uh, per, say, second, right? This is collisions per second per molecule, all right? Uh, this is sigma, that's that cross-section, which is, again, pi d squared, where d is the molecular diameter. V bar here is the average speed of the molecules, and last time we learned how to calculate that uh, starting from the, uh, the Boltzmann distribution of speeds, uh, so we could turn that and replace that with an equation, which is what this version does over here, uh, and then it's got N over V here, that's just the gas density, okay, uh, and so uh, that tells us how many molecules would be in a volume uh, where the volume is just this quantity in front, sigma times uh, V bar, right, because we said that would be, sigma is the area of the end of the tube, V bar is how long the tube is, so that thing is the volume of the tube. This is the gas density. Sigma sticks around, uh, that's pi d squared. This uh, term here, that's just the equation uh, for the, uh, the average speed, right? Uh, we put that one together uh, last time. Uh, over here, this just says take n over v, the gas density, and replace that uh, with p over kt. So that just treats our gas as an ideal gas, uh, and it gives us uh, the uh, right quantities we want there, okay? This is what would happen. This would be the collision number, collision frequency, if the other molecules weren't also moving. The other molecules are moving, and when the other molecules are moving too, uh, then what happens essentially is instead of just using V-bar, uh, the average speed of one molecule, we want to get that to reflect the relative speed, uh, meaning that there's a chance the molecules are coming right at each other. There's also a chance that they're moving one slowly and one fast, and they're chasing each other like this. Uh, there's an average over a lot of uh, different geometries that takes place for that, okay? The result of all that is that uh, the average relative speed is just the square root of two uh, times that, uh, that average speed for one molecule, all right? So that's going to increase the number of collisions some because some of the molecules that start off outside of the tube will actually be inside the tube by the time the molecule gets to the end of it, if we picture it that way. Okay, uh, and so that says we'd have to put uh, a square root of two term uh, in here, uh, which would effectively just multiply that equation that we have. So that gives us this one, which says ZA, uh, where we've taken off the prime because now we've unfrozen the other molecules, okay? So that Z prime equation is a little bit of a, uh, a strange hypothetical case. Uh, this one should be for real, uh, the collision frequency for a single hard sphere molecule uh, moving in a gas. So I just put a square root of two in front of it and everything else looks the same, okay? Uh, that gives me uh, the uh, number of collisions, uh, the rate of collisions for one molecule. Suppose instead of that, I wanted to find the overall rate of collisions in a, a, a collection of gas molecules, okay? To do that, uh, I'm gonna say, this is the number of collisions one molecule makes. If I multiply that by the density, that'll scale me up to how many molecules there are in there, but then I'm gonna divide by two because otherwise I'd be counting every collision twice, right? Every one of my collisions has one molecule bumping into another, 
So that's a collision for this molecule, and it's also a collision for that molecule. If I want to sum the total number of collisions, I don't want to count every one of them twice. Okay, so that gives me a dividing by two term uh, in there. Okay, that just says I'm going to take this equation, I'm going to multiply it by the gas density again, and then I'm going to divide by two. When I do that, I will get this one, which says now we've called it ZAA, uh, and take some time, look through the slides or your textbook uh, to get uh, get yourself comfortable with what the different uh, uh, terms or symbols are referring to. This is now not collisions per molecule, but just collisions uh, per second per unit volume uh, for a gas uh, at a particular temperature and pressure. Okay, uh, so that says I had ZA. Uh, I'm going to multiply this ZA uh, by the density. So here's my density. Okay, I'm going to divide by two. There's my divide by two term. Uh, this thing just says take the density and again replace it with P over KT. Now I'm going to take and put into that form the equation that we just got for the ZA piece, okay? So the ZA piece is just all of this, right? It's uh, the square root of two sigma up here, it's this piece, and it's another P over KT. All those pieces I just underlined, those would be the ZA up top. Uh, then I'm still dividing it by two and multiplying it by P over KT. Take all that together and I get this final term down here, okay? Uh, so that says the total number of collisions uh, will depend on uh, sigma. That's the collision cross-section, right, which is related to the molecular diameter. Uh, bigger molecules will bump into each other more often, right, because they're bigger targets. Uh, they're easier to hit, okay? Uh, I've got uh, a mass term in here, which uh, essentially survives out of the, uh, when we reduce down all the constants and things here, uh, this mass term and that pi survive out of, uh, out of here. And then over here, I've got a P squared term, right? Uh, that P squared term says the collisions, uh, basically all the collisions are two molecule collisions. They're what uh, fancy word for that down here. Uh, we call them bimolecular. Uh, that just says, I don't expect to have just giant pileups where lots of molecules uh, collide with one another all at once. So it's, that's why this ends up being a P squared piece. Right. Uh, it's similar to what happens, gosh, if you do rate laws. A lot of you are in a, a kinetics class, I understand. Uh, and if you talk about rate laws, you say for bimolecular uh, reactions, you're going to end up with a second order uh, term in your rate law. That's because that collision frequency depends on P squared. Okay. So this result is actually very important for modeling reaction kinetics, uh, which I, I just kind of led myself into. Uh, the reason for that is if I start thinking about molecules reacting with one another, the minimum uh, thing that has to happen generally in order for two molecules to be able to react is they have to bump into each other. Uh, in general, we don't envision a molecule over here and a molecule over there somehow managing to just like toss an atom uh, across the room uh, and somehow react with one another from a distance, right? They're going to have to actually physically get into contact for that to happen. Uh, and that uh, reflects the idea that we will uh, eventually uh, use this uh, collision frequency to think about how we could put together a model uh, for reaction rates. To illustrate some of these uh, ideas, uh, what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to work through uh, some examples uh, related to what we're just uh, talking about, okay? So what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to take uh, nitrogen molecules or a sample of nitrogen. Uh, I'm going to go 298 Kelvin and one bars. That's more or less uh, atmospheric temperature and pressure, okay? So this is just uh, a decent approximation of the nitrogen in the air that's uh, surrounding you right now. Uh, for those, we're going to calculate uh, the mean speed and then the mean relative speed, right? The mean speed, we have that equation from last time, and we looked at some uh, plots in the last video that sort of showed us how those behave. Uh, the mean relative speed, that's just going to be that square root of two term to, to get that one. Uh, collision frequency, how, what's the collision rate for a particular molecule? And then what's the total number of collisions per second uh, in my, uh, my gas uh, under those conditions, all right? So that's the things we're going to go to work on, okay? Uh, the mean speed and the mean relative speed, if I want to get those, uh, I start off with the equation that's here, right? Uh, I'm using nitrogen, and so uh, for nitrogen, uh, I will have that uh, the mass of nitrogen uh, is equal to, uh, what, uh, 4.65 times 10 to the minus 26th kilograms. Okay, so I'm going to grab that number and stick it in down here in the calculation. Uh, so this gives me uh, what? Uh, gives me eight uh, times Boltzmann's constant, so 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd 
Uh, I'm in joules and Kelvin there. Uh, my temperature I have up there, 298K. Down here, I've got a pi, uh, and I've got my 4.65 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms, and all that uh, is in the square root. Uh, I put that up and I get, uh, what, I get about 476 meters per second. Uh, so that's my, uh, what, that's my mean speed, the average speed of a nitrogen molecule at 298 Kelvin. I want to know the mean relative speed or the mean speed of approach between a pair of molecules. Uh, and that just says I want uh, the, the relative speed. Uh, that's just the square root of two uh, times the V bar. And so that just says I do the square root of two times my 476. And when I do that, uh, the notes next to me say I get about 673 uh, meters per second, okay? Uh, and that uh, gives us the average uh, relative speed or the average uh, approach speed is, I guess, the easiest way for me to think about that uh, for a pair of molecules in this gas, okay? Uh, let's work through the list of things we said we're going to do from there. Collision frequency for an individual molecule. So that's the, t the one we derived a moment ago that is just ZA, uh, should come out in collisions per second per molecule. So I should end up with just units basically of one over seconds uh, from this when I, uh, I work through everything. And I think I still have all the pieces I need for this, right? Oh, I have to get that sigma term, I guess, uh, in order to do this. Uh, but I'll probably just put that together as I go, I think, right? Oh, no, I have sigma. It's given to me at the top of the slide. I should pay attention to what I typed there, right? Uh, so this is what? It's square root of two uh, times the sigma, which is up there as 0.45. Uh, it's in nanometers squared up there. So I'm going to change that to 0.45 and I'm going to make it times 10 to the minus 18. And when I do that, I'm going to say now it's in meters squared. Okay. Uh, that just gets me into SI units because I'm going to put everything in an SI units to make sure that I don't have to do conversions at the end, right? So a nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters. So a square nanometer is 10 to the minus 18 square meters. Okay. Uh, the next piece, uh, this, oh, let me take the square root of two out of there, actually. We just found the relative speed, right? So the relative speed is the square root of two uh, times this piece over here. So I'm just going to take the number we got there and I'm going to put it in here as 673 meters per second. Okay, uh, so again, that's both of those terms, the square root of two and then the, uh, the square root term in parentheses in the middle there. Uh, both of those are baked into that 673 meters per second number. Uh, then lastly, over here, I've got uh, my pressure over KT. Uh, I'm at one bar and one bar, I wanna put that in Pascals. Uh, so one bar is 10 to the fifth Pascals uh, and a Pascal is a Newton per square meter. So I'm gonna write it that way for P. Down here, uh, I've got a K, uh, so that's 1.38, uh, 10 to the minus 23 again. And I've got a T, so that's still 298K. Okay, uh, and if you take all of those things, if you parse through all the units, uh, it should turn out that we end up uh, with just uh, the only thing that survives is seconds on the bottom, uh, which are going to come basically from in there and everything else is going to take care of itself uh, when we do that, uh, which is how it should be, of course. Uh, and then if I get the number for that, this says that I get about 7.32 times 10 to the ninth uh, per second, okay? So that says that any given nitrogen molecule should be undergoing about seven billion collisions in a second uh, at uh, somewhere around room temperature and pressure, right? So we have a lot of collisions taking place. Right. Uh, there is, in fact, among people that do kinetics uh, work uh, and dynamics work with molecules, uh, there's kind of a, a, a rule of thumb uh, in that field that says there are uh, roughly 10 to the seventh collisions per second per tour uh, that take place uh, in a uh, 
that a molecule will undergo uh, in a gas, okay? Uh, if I use that uh, thing right now and just scaled up to my, my uh, atmospheric pressure, uh, the notes beside me say I'd get about 7.7 .7 times 10 to the ninth uh, collisions per second for my molecule. So it does a decent job of getting us uh, certainly order of magnitude uh, kind of estimate of what's going on. All right, uh, we have another piece of the problem, which is we're going to find uh, the total number of collisions per second in the uh, actual entire gas, right? Uh, and so let's do that. Uh, I have to flip the page here. Uh, I get uh, now the equation that we have uh, looks like this. I'm going to use the fact that I already know the ZA piece, right? Because that's the one I just calculated. So instead of taking the expanded equation that put everything back to being in terms of the masses and, and KE and whatnot, uh, I'm just going to go from this one because we have handy the value for ZA, uh, the piece that we just calculated, okay? Uh, so my ZA number is 7.32 times 10 to the ninth uh, per second. Uh, I've got that over 2, uh, then I've got that times P over KT. We just had that set of things a moment ago, uh, so that's 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared up here. Uh, it's Boltzmann's constant. And it's 298K. All right, uh, and if I take all those things and multiply them out, uh, that says that I get 8.83 times 10 to the 34th, uh, and that's got units now of meters to the minus three per second, all right? So my first thought is that's a really large number, right? Uh, and then I look at my equation up here and I say, well, I've got a 10 to the ninth and a 10 to the fifth on top, so that's 10 to the 14th, and I'm dividing all that by 10 to the minus 23rd, so I ought to be getting a big number. Then I'm gonna look at the units, right? That's the total number of collisions that would take place in one second, but in a cubic meter of gas. Right? So in a cubic meter of gas, I've got quite a lot of molecules, right? Because that's a big volume. Uh, we're at uh, roughly atmospheric pressure, so the, the number of molecules in there is very large. Uh, and so the fact that uh, that's a number of moles of gas that are going to be in there, right? So the fact that they're undergoing a large number of collisions every second uh, seems like it probably makes sense uh, in those terms, right? It's that, that per meter cube thing uh, that makes me not feel bad about that, uh, that giant number, uh, because a meter cube is a large volume, so I would expect to be having having a lot of uh, collisions take place in there. Right. Uh, I did uh, stick in another question here, actually, uh, which is uh, re relating back to the air around you right now again. Uh, and it asks, which of the following types of collisions would be most frequent, nitrogen, nitrogen, or oxygen, oxygen, uh, or nitrogen, oxygen, OK? Uh, I confess, in order to answer that, it does uh, count on you knowing a little bit about air. Uh, but uh, hopefully everyone understands the composition of air. Uh, if you do, uh, you know that in air there is roughly 80% nitrogen uh, and 20% oxygen, okay? Uh, because of that, uh, the sizable majority of all the molecules are nitrogen, uh, and that should mean that uh, the most probable collisions, the most frequent collisions, are going to be uh, those that are just nitrogens banging into nitrogens, just because there's a lot more of those present uh, in the air. Right. Uh, and so if I were to take the total number of collisions, I could roughly say that uh, I could get the fraction that would be uh, nitrogen, nitrogen by using those, uh, those fractions, the mole fractions, say, uh, to do that. Right. So that's, that's a reasonably straightforward thing to, uh, to convince ourselves of. I think the final uh, idea for us uh, in this uh, particular video is going to be the notion of the mean free path. All right. Uh, the mean free path is actually just the average distance a molecule, an individual molecule, will travel between collisions, okay? Uh, it's just how far does a molecule go uh, from one collision until it's likely to have another, okay? Uh, this is important for a variety of things. Uh, it's important in some experiments. If you want to look at things where the molecules are not banging into one another, uh, then you have to make sure that your mean free path is longer than the dimensions of your experiment, say, uh, things like that. The time between collisions is 1 over ZA, where ZA is the rate of collisions for a given molecule, right? Uh, so if a molecule makes uh, x collisions per second, uh, that says there's just uh, 1 over x seconds between collisions, okay? That should make sense uh, that if I take the frequency and do 1 over that, I'm going to get a time, right? 
the average speed is still v bar. Uh, and so that says if I want to find the mean free path, and the mean free path is generally referred to uh, with the symbol lambda, uh, just like a wavelength, uh, that's going to be the average speed divided by that collision frequency. Uh, I put in down below the different terms for that. Uh, and when we do that, the uh, those pieces, which are both v bar, essentially those cancel. Uh, and I'm left with a relatively simple expression over here. Uh, I've got kt square root of 2 sigma over p. Okay, uh, That's going to give me the, the mean free path for my molecules. I've got uh, one more uh, calculation to finish out this video with, I believe. So uh, for argon at 300 Kelvin in a one liter cubic container, uh, so we have a cubic uh, cube that's one liter volume altogether. Uh, we're going to find the pressure at which the mean free path is similar to the size of the container, meaning a molecule will go about the distance across the container uh, between collisions. Uh, and then we're going to find another extreme, which is the pressure uh, at which the mean free path becomes similar to the size of an argon atom. So that last one's going to be a very high pressure uh, because that's going to mean our, it's, it's a very, very short interval between collisions for that. And I have an equation there for the mean free path. So this is really just a relatively simple bit of, uh, of doing some, uh, some math here, I think. Uh, so uh, this is, let me flip back for a second. That's the equation for mean free path. Uh, the net top slide here, this is the same equation, just rearranged to solve for P. Right. Uh, so that's the pressure where I get a, if I put a mean free path in there together with the other things that I know, uh, the uh, sigma for argon and my temperature, then I'll get a value for what the pressure needs to be to make that happen. Okay. In order to do this, I have to first remind myself that uh, one liter, uh, let me just come down here and say one liter uh, is equal to 10 to the third centimeters cubed. Okay. Uh, so the edge length of a one liter cube Uh, is going to be 10 centimeters or a tenth of a meter. All right. Uh, yeah, a liter is actually, you can call a liter a decimeter cubed, although people don't uh, generally uh, think of it that way. Uh, let's just fill stuff in then. We get Boltzmann's constant 1.38 times 10 to the uh, minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. Uh, we get a temperature up there, and I said I was going to use 300 Kelvin this time. Uh, down here, I get a square root of 2. I get my cross-section, uh, which was 0.36 in square nanometers, so I'm putting in 0.36 again times 10 to the minus 18. Uh, that'll get me into square meters. Uh, and then I'm putting in my edge length for the mean free path. So I'm putting in 0.1 meter because I said I wanted to find the uh, pressure at which uh, the mean free path would be the same as the size of the uh, container. So that's the, the size of the box there. Okay. Uh, let me then just solve that stuff. If I do that, uh, that says that I get a pressure of 0.08 one say that's in pascals, uh, which is the SI unit of pressure, but is not a popular unit of pressure with anyone. Uh, and so uh, that's also equal to about eight times 10 to the minus seventh atmospheres, for those of us that are familiar with atmospheres, uh, or it's also equal to about six times 10 to the minus four tor, if you like tor. Uh, for a pressure unit, right? Uh, 760 tor or an atmosphere if you haven't uh, bumped into those for a while. So that's a, a reasonable level of vacuum. It's easily uh, achievable uh, in, in a lab using all sorts of different pumping schemes, but it is a, a reduced pressure, okay? Uh, the other one we're going to calculate uh, is the uh, pressure at which the mean free path is uh, reduced to being the size of the molecules, okay? Uh, and if I do that, first I need to get the molecular diameter, which is just my sigma uh, square root of sigma over pi. Uh, so I'm going to put this stuff in here. This sigma again was 0.36 times 10 to the minus 18 uh, square meters. I have a pi down here. All right, uh, so if I divide that out, this says I get uh, 3.39 times 10 to the 
minus 10th in meters, uh, which would be, uh, if I wanted to, I could say that's 339 picometers, uh, which seems like an okay sort of size for an argon atom. It's a reasonably large atom. Uh, and so I'm not bothered by that. That's now going to be my mean free path. And if I repeat that calculation with that number in there, uh, I again get P is equal to Boltzmann's constant times temperature uh, square root of two uh, sigma and lambda. And when I fill all those terms in there, uh, I'm going to get uh, relax things a little bit and not write units this time, I think. Uh, square root of 2, uh, I get my 0.36 times 10 to the minus 18, still in meters squared because everything here is in SI units. Uh, and then I'm putting in the meter version of my uh, diameter that I just found for the mean free path. I do that. Uh, and when I do all that and solve it, I get a pressure that is about 2.4 times 10 to the seventh uh, pascals. Uh, about 10 to the fifth pascals is an atmosphere. Uh, and so that's uh, roughly equal to 240 atmospheres uh, which, uh, for those of you that are more into engineering units, uh, my notes also say that's about 3,500 PSI. Uh, and so that's a very high pressure, right? It should make sense to say we have to get to a very high pressure in order to, to get the mean free path down that small. Uh, if we got to that high of a pressure, the idea that we have the ideal gas model kind of cooked into those equations we're using would make this result uh, a little bit dubious, right? Because by the time we get to 240 atmospheres, the notion that our argon is acting like an ideal gas uh, is almost certainly no longer reasonable, okay? All right, uh, that completes uh, this particular video, uh, ideas about collisions between molecules. Thanks.